Okay, I think that works. Well, it was going to feel like conducting today anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, here's a brief overview of today. I love that that's there. That's so nice. Okay, so we're going to review the Keys 1 rules, which was from like three weeks ago. Um, and then we'll have a brief review of for those who weren't here for the aux keys. So basically that is just asking two main questions when you are playing aux keys. Um, we'll talk about some building and some layering of patches. We'll have some hands-on demos. So thank you everyone for volunteering because you're all going to play one of these keyboards at one point. And um, We'll talk about the dynamics of how keys one and keys two work together, or keys two is also synonymous with aux keys. Piano is synonymous with keys one, so if I use different jargon, that's what's happening. Um, blending with the rhythm section, again, it's kind of similar to what we talked about before, um, but you obviously have a different perspective on how you are blending as a secondary keys instrument instrumentalist versus keys one. And then we'll just review and we'll play some things and ask any questions that you guys might have. So does anyone remember the four major roles of a keys one player? And it's okay, I can help you. Okay, what is one way that a keys person could function? Keys one, so piano, um, the person who typically plays a piano patch sound, more louder, not aux keys. Rhythm, yep, that's one. The lead line, that's another. Yep, and then kind of a similar way, the fourth one is just providing a foundation underneath guitar during songs. So like, we praise you, a thousand names, very guitar, drum groove driven, so the pianist doesn't really have to do work on that fact. Same for aux keys as well. And then do you remember the four things that make a good keys player? Maria's nodding, give me one of them. Um, steady beat and in the pocket. In the pocket, what does that mean? Um, consistency of any pulse. Puzzle piece fits just perfectly. I love that. Great. Can someone give me another good quality of a keys player? This is also applicable to aux keys because they're the same breed of musician. Yes, so ranges. Another way to say that would be intentional voicing. So if you want it to be super thin and spacey. Oh, I have my organ on, sorry. Thin and spacey versus very thick. And this is the word we use a lot in our 496 peop, uh, reviews is like making sure the layers between all the different pitched instruments, guitars, acoustic, and rhythm are not all in the same area. That would be very thick, like swamp waters to walk through. Um, I think there's uh, two more, so I'll give them to you. Intentional dynamics um, and stylistic choices. Stylistic choices meaning the little counter melodies you might play if you're holding a chord for a really long time and you're getting bored. But you don't just do it because you're bored, you do it because you know it'll add something nice texturally or timber, timber like, but being intentional with adding those decoration pieces. Ms. Liz, could I add a fifth one? Yes. Um, really feeling comfortable, I'll say proficient, or feeling comfortable in all of these. That would be very important. I think the worksheet, yes, he's voicing worksheet is very good to making that four things, five things attainable. Um, a lot of the things that we talk about in that worksheet is just getting comfortable with the shapes. Uh, Mr. Working has similar terms called skeletons, that if you can play these skeletons falling out of bed down the stairs, then you will be great set up for success. I mean, okay, this sounds really funny. As a worship like leader, the key that scares me the most Surprisingly, in B major, I don't know why. A lot of worship songs are in it. I just have a hard time translating that set of keys to numbers for some reason. I don't know why. But as long as I keep one, two, and five in my right hand, so do, re, so, I can play any chord, anything in the bass, and just change my left hand. And it sounds great. So it's, it's really great to review all your key signatures, not just for theory. Would it be accurate to say?
say that if you were not translating the numbers but just had the letters, B would not present much of a problem? I think so. I think it's because my church works in numbers a lot, so it's just a shift in ministry adjustment, obviously. It's not to say I don't know what those are in the majors, but no, it's just sure. something off the fly. I'm like, oh, I have to think a little bit harder about this. Yeah. Because my church hangs out in congregational keys of G and D. We're not in B and E a lot because one, our worship leaders don't sing there, and two, our congregation can't sing there. So we take everything down a step and a half pretty much. Yes. Praise God. There we go. <laughs> um, so again, that keys voicing worksheet, if you guys haven't been uh, going over that or having questions on it, just let me know and we can fill that out. Here are two questions that you want to ask when you're playing an ox keys, when you're helping someone with ox keys, when they're questions I'll want to play. How can I, or the person playing aux keys, best support and complement um, keys one? So, not distracting, not cluttering, and not letting it up. And then second, what type of player is the keys player? Are they more busy? Are they open, sparse, full, and simple? So, in more ways than another, I told this to my EG, to, uh, my electric guitar players, that when you are playing EG2, you actually have the more difficult role because you're not playing what's obviously recognizable on the track. Yeah. Um, so EG1 or Keys1 will play all the lead lines typically and the chords. You as a secondary player, not secondary meaning less important, but you know, second position is, okay, so if I'm not playing what's most recognizable, what can I play that doesn't distract, that doesn't clutter, and it doesn't take away, but it actually adds and enhances to what Keys 1 is doing. So it kind of makes you be like, okay, I normally want to play the lead line to who you say I am in F sharp major, right? But Keys 1 will play that, electric guitar will play that. So what does that leave me with? Almost like a, I feel like two people can go two ways with this. Or sorry, one person can go two ways. I'm chopped liver because there's nothing left for me to play, so I'm just gonna hang out on this and just raise my hands the whole time. Not bad if you're a beginner or you're unsure of what to add, but the second perspective you can also say is, I have a little bit more creative freedom to add some colors, timbres, or anything that might enhance what they're playing. Um, so on, um, I think they're doing Lion and the Lamb, one of the groups, 496, there are two EG players, very phenomenal players, and they already have tracks. And I look at EG2 player and I say, I dare you to do the harmony on the lead riff in between. So the first time the riff happens, um, I'm gonna play it over here since that's all I play sounds. The first time the lead guitar does the, um, because your keys player might have to feel confined because of the singer writing stop style of whole notes, very simple and busy, but then you can have fun playing like arpeggiations, like a little more attack on that, sorry. And then you can play and stuff. We'll get to layering patches, but you have more freedom than just doing piano diamonds. And you have more freedom than just doing the band hits or just the pre-written lead lines, which is kind of fun. So don't see keys too. Um, I unfortunately saw keys too the first time I played it as a setback, and that was a pride issue for me. That was a heart issue for me. But it's another way of one, using your gifts and talents to serve the Lord, and two, helping another person step into keys one while you have a chance to also step into keys two and challenge both of you guys. So it's a great thing. It really is. It's not your less important. If it's that, then it's something like I struggle with and we can chat about it another time. So here are some basic things for 
washi pad. And this is typically, um, a lot of people have this pad, not this specific one that I'm about to play for you, but something of the sorts where it's just warm, not super busy, and hold on, I want it to last a while. I, yeah, so it's not super busy, and it's very s smooth, muted. Are there any words that you think of that come in mind when you hear like this? Piano one players or keys one player actually will have keys and pad listed under. So that's just a communication you want to have between your players. So you're not getting too washy, too ambient sounds. Um, yeah, so just double check those sounds. Um, number two, bright pad or a high pass filter. This is one of my favorite tricks. Um, every keyboard is different and every main stage um, v VST, is that the word I'm looking for? Wow. Virtual oh, VST. Yeah. Thank you. Josiah is here to help me define my terms too. VST, anything where you're having a virtual instrument on your computer, such as like a MIDI, like you're using a keyboard as a MIDI through a laptop. Uh, you can play around with the EQ or the frequency effects. So when I say HPS as a high pass filter, or meaning the upper end of the register, that's when we tell our keys players, hey, stop playing down here and play up here. It actually brightens these tones up. So you can actually make it a little bit more energy and fuzzy. That's the word I like to say, is like fuzzy. And when I visually hear or visually see this sound, it's like the TV when you took out a VCR and it goes Kshh. That might be a little bit old for some people, but that's what I think of. It's like that busy black and white signal. Um, that's very really good for like, lead lines if you want to double stuff up an octave. Um, so, um, ba, da, ba, 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 ba. kind of cuts through everything that everyone's doing down here. And again, your part as aux keys is not going to be in the same range as keys one because you want to be heard. Obviously, you're not doing this only to be heard, but your part shouldn't mutter, muddy and clutter. I just said mutter. <laughs> You know the point. Mutter. It, it sounds like what it is, right? It's mutter. Um, again, some other fun things that you can do is arpeggiations. Um, one of the groups is doing a hill song, song called Awake My Soul. So you could do. Um, kind of like an arpeggio when you used to do them in your KPE. You're filling out the chord. There is an effect called the arpeggiator on the Nord. Here's the thing, it requires you to tap precisely, kind of like a guitarist has a delay pedal on time, and then it requires you to play your thing on time. Otherwise, if you do not do either of those things perfectly, it will be off the entire time. So I would just recommend playing your 16th notes manually by hand as also a good warm-up for a keys player. So just, just rely on your 16th notes with your click in your head versus trying to hold it and get it right. Liz, did you just change the attack? I did change the attack because before it was a little delayed. Because so, that's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's this thing called attack. I think we were talking about it last time when we were here. If it's really low, It took a little bit of time to get full there. I turned it all the way off because I like my sound right when I want it. And so another way that we can actually have a tack with all of our washy sound is what I like to see when I'm off keys. I put a piano or an EP on soft or mute, and so I can still have the downbeat of stuff myself. So let's say I'm not even doing that lead line and I'm just doing washy stuff. Um, 
I'm gonna have this um, Wurlitzer on. Let me play it. It's in, nope, it's off. There we go. It's like an electric piano, similar to a Rhodes. It's a reed piano. It's not a piano sound, but when I play it with, there we go. When I play it with my synth, there's still a little bit of like, I know when I'm pressing it with an attack there's an action of still me pushing down the keys. I like that for myself personally as an aux player because to have that rhythmic control or perception of control is just nice to have a definitive beginning of each pitch versus just the pad going whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. Like there's a definitive. Yeah, so it helps you to be on time if you have late attack or something else of a setting, at least you're like on time with your initial pitches. The last thing again is everyone's favorite, an organ or B3. Now, I'm going to just let you know that I am not the master of this, but I'm going to encourage you that one of the next slides later on says, um, I'm teaching you what I've known because I just sat down in front of this keyboard or a keyboard, and I've experimented. So um, you can also use uh, YouTube resources, which I can send later out, but a lot of the things that I have found that work for me are just from doing it. So like everything here is not like, this is the only way you can do this, but this is a great entry point of what I've learned so far, and I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. So even for the organ, like you have two presets on the Nord, you can have a soft preset, and then a loud preset, meaning like a more muted, quieter stuff, and then sometimes you can hear when Colby or Adam play, they have one that's more for underscoring and then they have one for like full chords that are like, wah. And I'm not gonna try to mimic those exact settings between the pipes, I'm not super knowledgeable. I just know that when I like it brighter, I'm gonna go fuller. When I want it to be quieter and underscoring, I'm gonna use the soft one. So there's a couple of things that you can just explore on your own time. Again, not everyone owns a Nord, I understand that, but you can download on main stage or any like MIDI computer setup, an organ patch, and then you can manipulate the drawers or the pull bars from there. Um, has anyone, does everyone know what I'm talking about when I say the draw bars and everything? Would you like to come and see? Come and see, Psalm 34. So when you get a chance to look at a B3, it will, a real B3, yes. it makes a lot of sense. So, um, for those who have never seen the Nord before, you have three sections. You have your organ over here, piano, and synth. Um, so the organ is obviously under organ. We're going to talk about the B3, which is the most popular used in the CCM music context. These lights mean the volumes of the pitches, and these basically reflect different harmonics. So you know when guitar players are doing the little touch thing, but they're not pressing the fret, and they can make a harmonic? That's what kind of these things are. So it's usually a one a fifth above, a one a fifth, a one a fifth, and then there's one that's a third. Never turn the third on because it's just, it doesn't sound nice when you play a bunch of them. Because when I play it for this, you're gonna hear, you can hear a C and a G, right? You hear that E on this one? Here, let me get rid of them all. You see I'm playing a C, but to my pitched people, that's an E. Let me put it in the octave. But if I'm gonna play a C sus chord, I'm not just gonna get this third. I'm gonna get this third, and then I'm gonna get this third. So listen. So it sounds like an E major sus right now, but if I play it with the other things, you're getting, that's basically what you're getting. So never play this flute four. That can just, I'm sure some people use it. I don't know how, and I'm, I don't know when, but it's not today. So this is a general setting for an organ. I like to put it up an octave so I can be heard again. This is, stop mode, stop. Um, have you ever seen an organ player, they like, they play and they tap something over here and then they tap it? Yeah. That's called the Leslie. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that makes it go, wah. So ready? So right now it's off. I have to turn it on. There we go. Um, and then you can actually do it in between. And it, sorry, this is the rotary speaker. So you can, when you turn it on, you hear it like shimmer and then turn it off. Yeah. So right now, again.
again, the one that I don't use is the third harmonic because it makes all the thirds come out of every single note I'm playing and that doesn't sound nice. Yeah. The one in the five of everything else sounds great as long as you do very open, open voicings. As soon as you do a chord, it gets a little bit, a little bit, yes, dissonant. But again, play with it, no pun intended, and we will, <laughs> we will see. So that's, that's the organ. Here's the take a seat. Actually, Keely, go ahead to the piano. <laughs> If you took some time to have fun with the worksheets, I chose really simple songs where they don't change a lot of chords all the time. And so if you wanna just practice your piano open voices, I'll bounce between the two and we'll talk about your open voices, when to grow, when to be small and everything. And then if you're very familiar with piano and open voices, we'll put you on the aux keys and then you'll play kind of like a little lab. Woo. Okay. So I'm like, we're not gonna play the whole song, we'll just go from different sections and stuff. So how I need you, is everyone familiar with this song? Are you familiar? Okay. It's a ballad in 6-8. It's very, let me play a quick sample of it actually first. This will be a different key for the record. Um, what else is over here? Let's see, 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 probably is a more, I think the piano actually has a lead in the instrumental right before the bridge, just something like to keep it moving as everything's dying down. Usually when things die down, that's when us key players start to shine. Key, yes. key, yes. Mm. I don't like all the puns I make sometimes, but I, I, I like them too at the same time. So, so if we start at a chorus, let's just go, um, two chorus, I think it'll go two chorus, we'll play that like one time through, and then we'll jump to five instrumental, which it'll be a breakdown for going into the bridge, let's say two times, six bridge, two times. Um, we're gonna just play this as if this is verse, the chorus after verse two, so kind of bigger driving vibes, not as big as chorus three at the end, um, but more up, um, if you know the words, you can sing it along, but I also want you to pay attention to how one, how Keely's playing. I'm going to actually stick this. Actually, is she in the house, Josiah? Josiah. Hey, Josiah. Is she in the house, or can she be in the house? Okay, great. Maybe a little lower, actually. And then you can just mix it to make sure it's good between the two of us. Um, so we'll just also really quick. Did everyone see how we talked through the chart really quick, or how I talked through it? Very concise, dynamic-wise. 
Give them, give players what they need to know. You don't have to tell them how to play their instrument, but just give them specifics. Enough of a guide, but also let them have creativity and freedom to play how they want to play. And again, me as an ox player, my job is I'm going to try to figure out how she plays and how I can best compliment her. So I've never played this with her. I literally texted her maybe two hours ago. I was like, can you play for class? She's not in this class too, so. This is how much she, we have not prepared for this in the best way possible. So we'll go from two chorus, one time through, into the instrumental, which is down, and bridge maybe two times. Right? OK, so one, two, chorus, two, three, four, five, six. Either in what I did sound wise, what Keely did sound wise, anything. I think I just noticed like how we were like next, like different octaves. Mm -hmm. And like how Keely would leave the space below her and you were leaving the space below me there. Mm -hmm. That's a good observation. Yeah, so we're not playing over each other. Yeah. Um, again, I think I told you this example last time of the overhead screen projectors. If everyone just colored in the same part on the different sheets, it would just look like a muddy mess. Yeah. Um, if Keely's going to color on the bottom, I need to color on the top so both of our parts can be seen. Yeah. Similarly, she's going to play where she should play, and I'm adjusting to where she goes. Yeah. So in the chorus, full band, it might have seemed empty. Like, I was playing octaves down here, because I'm like, oh, there's no bass player. Yeah. Don't have to worry about that full band. Yeah. Um, chorus, I was actually above her. Mm -hmm. And then she did a little fun little ostinato counter melody to the instrumental. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to go below her. Mm -hmm. um, not to say you can never play here, but it's like, oh, she's going to jump up. I'll jump down, yeah. because I want to make sure it's all covered. Yeah. yeah. Again, these sounds are not my typical sounds, but you can find things that complement what people do on that sense as well. So it's not always, it's not always gonna be the same if you don't have the same settings, but if you know enough to manipulate and make it sound good to whatever what they're playing, it'll be a good mix for out there. Um, another thing that I like to say is, again, when we're looking at multi-tracks, um, the keyboard is, it's probably the same keyboardist recording eight different tracks between keys one and keys eight. So my job as aux keys is to figure out what they did from aux three to aux eight, because keys one and two is probably your lead line or your rhythm playing. And then the other thing is just fun little things they did. So like maybe a lick here or a patch here, maybe they switched to organ in the middle, which I was gonna do, and then I realized I didn't save my patch from when we were doing it before, so I didn't wanna give you a wall of sound that just sounded ugly. Um, but you can add different layers. Oh, look, there it is now. I was going to do this in the upbridge. You are, oh no. You are powerful. Gotta That's one of those counter melodies, just a walk down. Five, four, three, two, one. You don't have to 
don't have to play the most complicated jazz line ever. It's, it's not that. It's little, little melodic lines that can just fill it. Your pentatonic scale is very fun in worship music. It, it works beautifully for any type of lick. Thank you, Kiwi. You did phenomenally. Um, would you like? Yes. So thank you for pointing that out. In my head, when it's building, electric guitar guitars are going to come with bright attacks. So if they're taking, this sounds really mean like a game of chess. If they're taking over these squares, I need to claim my territory. Not my territory, but my musical note output territory up here. Because again, don't want to clash, don't want to muddy, don't want to distract. Very simple don't rules. Um, on the first page left column and then we'll go right into bridge one and just go down from there we'll go right from chorus to bridge one do you want it to be like down like it usually is in the refrain mm -hmm. yeah we'll build them up so there are we won't play through all six of them yeah. how about we do one up chorus oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. and then we'll break it down mm -hmm. into the down bridge okay one small one medium one big so basically all, like all small, one medium, one big, and then done. And then done. Okay. I mean, if you, if you end up going to the chorus and we're feeling it, I will follow. Mm -hmm. um, but just for teaching purposes, we'll start with one chorus, head to the bridges, and I'll call it out too. I want to make sure I have my patches now. Thank you. 
super muddy, but you guys can tell me if you thought that was muddy and it's okay because I couldn't hear myself. Was it muddy at any point? When was it muddy? I couldn't really hear you at the beginning, but then at the end it kind of Yeah, so I was playing around with my organ. What happened was, I think I turned on an additional piano sound by accident, and that's not what I was trying to do. I was trying to just turn on my organ, and I turned on another sound, so that's why you heard like five different patches coming from my piano while she's playing piano already. So, that's one thing you want to make sure is that you're not turning on something that's not supposed to be turned on. Again, just use your uh, technique, getting used to what um, the keyboard asks and being very familiar with it, so that way you're not distracted by this when you're playing. What's really easy to do is just holding the one and the five. Oh, that's why. I have so much bottom end. Just turn it down. Uh-huh. Okay. My organ was on both channels. That's why it was happening. That's what it was going to be. Did you turn on the, um... The Leslie? A couple times. So what happens is, on the Nord, you have two profiles. You have profile A and profile B, and then you can play A and B at the same time. My profile on organ A, it was very sparse. My program, or my profile B organ, was very full. I turned on organ B by accident and thought I was on organ A the whole time. So that's what happened. Um, can we play a full chorus of uh, this one more time? Now that I'm not blowing everyone's ears out with wall sounds. Okay, ready? Chorus, two, three, four. Much better? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, obviously we have some technical difficulties, but that's again what you get a part of learning and trial and error of instruments. Um, does anyone want to play either Glorious Day or a chorus of Greater New Board for anyone who didn't play? It's okay if you don't want to. I can just give you the music and you can explore that another time. I'm going to take your silence as yes, and please move on. I don't look like piano. Okay, so kind of what we just talked about. Those are everything that we talked about last time with the chart, like the role of keys one. And I just kind of merged this whole column together because as I was writing them, I'm like, you know what? Keys two is just kind of the same thing for every song. Just listening. How can I not clutter? And how can I complement again? So again, primary filling up the upper register in each respective part of the song. So if it's a low bridge, then I can come down a little bit, or even go under keys one, like we heard with Keeley. Um, in the fuller section, I'm probably gonna be up with my brighter patches, that fuzzy sound to cut through everything. And again, my role is, it depends a lot on keys one, similar how EG and EG two function together. Um, remember the two questions to ask, how can I best support and add to keys one? Not clutter, not distract, or not muddy up. And then I'm analyzing how they're playing so I can play well. So I would say both, actually between the two of you guys, I would say Keeley was more simple, not simple or bad, but like steady diamonds, more intentional with some things. And then Maria played more free melodic lines. Both are beautiful. I've played with people who are very secure in just whole notes. And then I've played with people like Colby Shorts, who's very rhythmic and melodic as well, and then you just mold to them. You fit. So I was able to play some more leads with Keeley, and then I didn't want to get in the way of Maria's lines, so I'm saying like, nope, she's keys one. She's more in the leading, um, melodic leading that way. So I'm just gonna do some whole notes, maybe so some, some suspensions for color, but not get in the way. I'm not gonna play my lines if she's playing beautiful eighth note lines already. We don't need two of them. We already have one. Um, kind of similar with worship leading, well, front line. We can have multiple people at I just sometimes it can get a little bit messy or a little bit confusing on who to follow in the congregation. Um, this is the last thing. Um, the top sentence is something that as I was writing,
writing, I was like, ah, this makes a lot of sense. And I wish I had learned this six years ago or even 10 years ago. The best way to play dynamically as an ox player is adjusting the timber, timbre and the range of the patches. So kind of what we just demonstrated. In lower sections, I'm going to probably be more ambient warm sounds. Um, not as like bright because I want to save that for when I'm building. Um, and again, for both of these, I did like low, building, full. So you can kind of see how you would change it throughout the song. So for timbre or patch layering, very ambient, like warm, again, colors, not super harsh or brash. Um, thinking of counter melodies or even um, playing a little bit more dynamically with more attack as we were talking about. And then brighter sounds on very high full choruses. Um, for adjusting the range, again, lower in the beginning if you want, or even higher, just not super in your face color wise. Um, building, we can invert. So if I'm in D, I'm going to take that off. Right now the A is on top, right? Or the fifth. If it's building, maybe I put the one on top. And then if it's building even more, I put the third on top, which is rare. I don't ever play the third because it feels so locked into tonality. Um, it's not wrong. I just always like to say, if I have the one on top and we need to go somewhere else, put the five on top. And if we need to know, go somewhere else, put the one on top, but just keep going until you run out of keys of that like little layering. Um, and again, you want to make sure rhythmically on the bottom point. Um, you're not always playing rhythmically like a pianist per se, because it's just a continual loop, but I'm going to follow the groove of the piece. So if it was yes and amen, that syncopated rhythm, I would have to play. train and develop leaders with aux keys. Yeah? Um, is like synthesizer sounds also considered aux keys or is that completely different? Yeah, so like I only did three pads because that was the first thing I could build in five minutes. But yes, so any type of lead sounds mm -hmm. in like we praise you, like that kind of more EDM hype music, like lion, rattle, your big openers, typically your celebration numbers will use those sounds as well. Sometimes I realize when you use a synth lead versus just a synth patch, a lead won't have you sustain a chord because they think it's a lead line. So you want to play one thing at once. So lead lines, you could probably play like a pentatonic scale, but not a chord. Sometimes there's, that's just a manual setting you can change. Yeah. When you're like underscoring, is that keys one or like, and then would keys two ever like play over that one? Mm -hmm. So like if pastor's coming up or a worship yeah, leader has a moment. Or yeah. So what I would do as aux player, if there's already keys one, if it's this situation, I'm only going to hold the one and the five down. Okay. That gives the pianist freedom to go tonally wherever they want. If you have an MD calling chords, mm -hmm. I'm playing the whole time only if it's a full band and we're kind of like building. Yeah. So like... Sometimes my church, the way we do it, is we start off with just piano and keys, and we eventually layer in EG swells. Mm -hmm. And then we might go into a groove underneath my pastor's, like, final response point, because he's like, this is driving it home, and then we're going to go right into the song. Yeah. Um, so at that point, our MD, or myself, is calling the chords, so then we can be all on the same page. Yeah. But if it's just 
worship leaders doing a small transition between the two songs. I'll only do one and five, and they can play every single chord, and I won't clash with them. But also, I might not have to if they're playing two keyboards. Because again, if I'm playing keyboard one, I probably always have at least one pad under me because it's a stylistic um, crutch, I like to call it. So you know how um, classical players like to pedal too much to cover their mistakes? Mm -hmm. Using a pad under a piano sound is a crutch to make sure that everything always sounds semi-good because sometimes you can hide your mistakes a little bit better and stuff. So if I'm playing aux keys on a keyboard and then keys one is also on a keyboard, I'll say, hey, are you playing pad? Yes or no? And they say yes. Then I say, okay, you have all the things. And I just might play my one and five up here to fill out the top if they're gonna play all down here. If they say no, then I'm gonna do one of these numbers and just let it sit while they play whatever. Yeah. Maybe not bass. Yeah. Maybe like here. It's a one, a five, an occasional two. Okay. The nine, because this works with all the chords. Again, I won't name them all, but yeah. it works yeah. uh, harmonically. So. Sorry, sorry, one more question. No, you're good. When you hold the pad, like, like if he's one player, he's holding a pad under that, how, how do they do that? Are they just like holding it down, or is there a button that they push? So, I guess it depends on the keyboard, too. Typically, you can layer the sounds. So, another thing, if you just have the general setting, mm -hmm. like pad is on and piano is on, every time you press a note, there are three sounds playing right now. My keys, my pad one, and my pad two shifted up an octave okay. right now. So it just plays as, like, as you play notes, it's telling the pad as well. Yeah, it kind of assigns it to all of them, unless you do keyboard assignment where you say, I only want pad up here, mm -hmm. or I only want pad here. Yeah. You can do that, um, that's getting more picky into things. You can actually design that on main stage, mm -hmm. um, which we can talk about outside of class another yeah. time. Mm -hmm. um, but it kind of just assigns it to all the keys unless you tell it not to. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thank you. 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 That you were given uh, a couple of weeks ago, whatever that was, when, whenever that was. Okay. Um, we've got to start doing some things that actually give you grades, yeah. which involve doing mm -hmm. in this class. Number one. Number two, um, just a couple of quick comments on what was said. Um, your counter melody, so when, when Liz mentioned counter melody, which is great, of course, you want to do that. Uh, this is part of the purpose of rehearsal. Is figuring out what everybody is, do, what everybody else is doing, because you have. Everybody had, don't we have an improvisation class? Yeah. Have you had it? Mm -hmm. okay. Part of improvisation is that um, part of improvisation is that you're playing in the gaps, but everybody can't play in all the same gaps. Yeah. Okay. You know, because you're playing chords, but then you play in a gap. You know, when something's being held out, that's where your improvising comes mm -hmm. in. And so you want to be careful on who's playing when. And the last thing is this. I shared this with a 496 group last night because um, I got to sit through a rehearsal where there was um, an awful lot of talent. But I said it like this. Our goal, have you ever seen a team of horses that are, you know, whether it's on a Western or whatever, there's like four or six horses that are pulling something? This is the idea of the rhythm section of worship team. We should all be pulling together. And sometimes when you get a lot of talented people there, it's more like a bunch of thoroughbreds all doing their own thing. Yeah. And it doesn't work as mm -hmm. well when all the thoroughbreds are doing their own thing, pulling their own direction, uh, not, not pulling as a team. And I think a lot of what Liz has said is the, the idea of what are you doing as a team? Let's pull together as a team mm -hmm. rather than I know my skills, I'm going, to dem you know, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate my skills on guitar or whatever. No, we're a team. We're all doing this together. Well, we got six of us, so we got however many of us that are doing it. And so if you can think about it in the way of, of, again, a team of horses pulling together rather than a bunch of thoroughbreds who are great on their own and may win races on their own, 
but don't come together well because they're all doing their own thing. Make sense? Yeah. Anyway. The most advanced players will listen to other people and not play everything they know. The most intermediate players will play everything they know and think they're great. They are probably great, but they don't have to play everything they know to be great. Yeah. Correct. That's it. That's class, I think. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I am prepared for next week already.